I think when we talk of opportunities, um, on that note, I, I tend to be a little bit frustrated uh, because um, there is this massive wave of, you know, fifth industrial revolution, you know, also kind of coming into Africa and, you know, we're looking at all these um, uh, advanced technology uh, investments, AI and all this, and there's a massive focus on that even for the continent. And I think that this is, um, uh, this is, this is not really where we are. <laughs> um, I'm on your side on that. Okay. Continue. Yeah, um, you know, when we're looking at kind of, uh, a lot of, uh, more private capital that's coming into the market, they're wanting these tech, you know, like replicas of Silicon Valley type investments in Africa and, you know, uh, clean tech and clean energy and, you know, and all this stuff. Um, and, you know, don't get me wrong, there there is massive advancements in technology, particularly when you look in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Egypt, and in Kenya. Uh, ironically enough, this is like the axis, right, on, yeah. on, on, on the African continent. But what about the rest? You know, there is still opportunity in just investing in food businesses, food processing, you know, without elements of tech and clean <laughs> and clean energy you know or you know just construction companies you know uh you know just kind of the so what i'm what i'm trying to say is that a lot of the time the 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 narrative in terms of investments and investment opportunities even is being set outside of africa and it's coming into africa but it's not really in line with the realities on the ground. Wow. Hello. Can you hear me now? Yes, clearly. Okay. Let's just try this. It was super noisy, but whatever oh. was just uh, stopped. Okay. So, let's <laughs> do it like this. I don't know technology. This was yeah. Working, so I don't know. It, do, it does so many, so many wonderful things. <laughs> How are you? I'm good. How are you, Akane? I'm good. I'm very good. The last time I spoke to you, you were in Switzerland, right? Yes, I was in Switzerland, and I just got back um, two days ago. Good, good. So, how was your trip to Switzerland? Switzerland was good. I have an office there as mm. well. Um, so I, I tend to split my time between, um, Switzerland and, um, Tanzania. Tanzania. Yeah. Okay. Wow. See, I wish I can be like you, you know, I wish I can split my time in UK and in, uh, Africa, you know, you can totally that... do it. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I, I know I'm, I can, I know I'm I can. Doing, I'm doing it now because I have a, I also have a, young like a newborn practice okay. six oh months. how old six months wow so um so she's not going to school or anything of course. Not, yeah. not interrupting anything she doesn't really need that kind of stability you know so we can afford to kind of go back and forth and she yeah. follows everywhere mm. but i think as soon as she has to start to school i can't do this anymore i have to yeah. choose yeah one place and stick to it so mm. Mm. Yeah, that's uh, something that uh, mothers in the modern world need to navigate and families, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have kids? Yeah, oh yeah, I have, I have three, three kids. Uh, the oldest is 18, she just entered university. 18? Uh, how? Yeah. Wait, you don't, you really look young. Okay, tell, tell me, tell me. Great jeans. Tell me, how, how young am I? You look like 35. Okay, very good. Well, I'm I'm 50. <gasps> <laughs> Amazing. Keep up doing whatever you're doing. Well, <laughs> thank God I'm alive. <laughs> you don't have a stressful life, huh? Because stress Ooh, is you do what... see? I like yeah, I yeah. like to uh, surprise people. Yes, that's good. 
now let, let's let's do this so introduce yourself to my audience and tell them what you do great so my name is Amne Swedi thank you Ekene for giving me this opportunity on uh, being on your platform I really appreciate You're welcome. it um, I'm a lawyer turned entrepreneur, um, and I basically founded a company called Shikana Investment and Advisory. It's now close to 10, a decade old, and it basically is a company that uh, focuses on unlocking opportunities in Eastern and Southern Africa. And we advise investors, foreign investors, as well as local investors or African investors, let's say, that are within the specific markets yeah. in terms of how to sustainably and effectively invest their private capital in different sectors uh, in those regions that I have just uh, mentioned. Yeah. We equally work with entrepreneurs. Um, this came about much later when i founded the company it was it, actually there's been a lot of evolution in the company yeah. just just as you know nothing is static right it's not supposed yeah. to be static anyway so initially it was a law firm then it evolved into an investment and advisory firm we were dealing with mainly foreign investors and you know large large groups of companies or high net worth individuals family offices funds etc but um, in working a lot on the continent, I was a little bit, became a little bit um, preoccupied, let's say, and disturbed by this notion of kind of private capital coming from outside, mm. coming to Africa, you know, but not really, um, not, not really trickling down to the local community and the reason why it's not trickling down to the local community uh beyond just you know employing you know uh locals yeah is because there are no local partners or no joint ventures right in that model yeah so um i started advising investors look you know why don't you look into investing with local partners uh, but then in, in, in going that route, um, discovered that a lot of, yes, there are a lot of business businesses, but the vis businesses are not necessarily investment ready. So it's very different. I think when you look in Europe versus when you look in, in, in Africa, right? Yeah. Like in, in macho markets. Yes. Compared. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So so a lot of the, the whole, the, the success doesn't look the same. So when you're looking at more mature markets, you know, a successful company is going to have certain systems in place, is going to have, you know, audited financial statements for yeah. three to five years, you know, et cetera. But in, and, and when you come with that same uh, understanding or expectation, but, you know, you can find very successful entrepreneurs. They don't have any audited statements, <laughs> have any systems. And yet, you know, they're clocking in millions, Yeah, uh, you know, millions, and they're doing extremely well, right? So marrying those two together made me feel, okay, I need to be a little bit proactive. So I work now with entre entrepreneurs and, and, and local businesses as well in terms of how to put in, in place those systems so that so that they can actually uh, be viable investments for consideration. Uh, excellent. Uh, into into sustainable joint ventures. So that that's kind of, that's what I do in a nutshell. Wow, excellent. See the evolution when you go to a virgin market. See, I I see Africa as a virgin market. The, there are so many things going on on the ground but we need to bring them to the to the open you know and what you what you are doing is allowing that to happen you know because uh, uh we certainly need investors you know if we if we really want to grow the the continent 
to be to 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 have viable businesses that will be sustainable we need investors and investors want to see hey let me see what you have done in the last 5 years you know and yeah yeah that's good that's that that's excellent see i i looked at your of course i look at the profile and you say you are africa's pickiest invest uh, investment advisor tell me you know tell me how you got that uh, monica right okay because um i think i i got that uh, label as being very picky because i'm extremely selective in terms of who i work with first of all um, I don't work with anybody just that ha comes in with US dollars and euros uh, because I care a lot about the continent. I care a lot of Africa, about Africa as an African. And therefore, I need to work with people who have the same values and who respect uh, the continent as well. So it's no secret that there's a lot of investors that come in, but it's not necessarily the right investors, right? So whenever we hear about this exploitation, et cetera, you know, that's not, of course it's, it's, it's going on on the ground, but it's going yeah. on by rogue investors that don't really have the values that, that don't really see, they just see Africa as a place that they can come and reap as much profit as possible and exit. Yeah. Um, that's not what uh, I'm about. They, they don't want to grow in there. They don't want to grow in there. Right. Yeah. And, we're really looking for a fast return, you know, an ROI of two to four years maximum, you know, minimal investment, uh, nothing just goes back into the economy, et cetera. This is not what I really, um, this, these are not the kind of companies that I work with, but I think also, um, I'm just very, um, cognizant of how, the African market, even though it's um it, it's emerging and it's growing um very fast, and there's a lot of more and more attention that goes to it. Um, I want to raise the bar in terms of um the the kind of investments that are here, the type of work, the type of people that you know that that are that are here, and so I tend to have very high expectations uh not only for the investors that are coming into the continent but also even for the local partners that we work with yeah uh, be it government or uh you know or just private companies as well um yeah so i'm i just i'm not really in it for the quick buck let's say um you know i'm not in it for that at all i want to make impact and i want the impact to be uh, generational, um, and I want everybody to be able to benefit from investment. Yeah. You know, yeah. a lot of the time, I think in uh, in African countries, especially when we look actually at what is going on in West Africa, right, in terms of uh, all the coups uh, that that you know that are taking place, yeah, <laughs> it has to do with a lot of the colonial systems that are still in in place. But I think that. When it comes to also investments, it's still very much entrenched and rooted in those colonial principles. Mm. Although West Africa is a more extreme version of, of that, right? Um, but I think a lot of the the in in other even African markets, uh the the colonial uh principles of investment are still very much there. And I really um uh, liking what I'm seeing actually on the continent the last few years, where you have more and more leaders yeah. that are bold enough to break away from all of that and to say that the people of Africa deserve more and they deserve better. And, you know, we, we are looking for more than just we are coming here to give jobs, even, even though there is no real requirement in terms of what type of jobs are you really creating and we're just here to give you tap pay you taxes but on the back hand of course you know we have these bilateral investment treaties that are in place so we're not really paying you know the taxes that we should pay 
and you know african countries are supposed to be feeling very grateful <laughs> we are, are a dark continent um and so therefore we should just be feeling very grateful for any dollars or euros or foreign exchange that is coming in you know and that's that um so i think that um i'm very much on team africa uh, and I'm very picky because of those things, because yeah. I put Africa first and I put the people first and I just refuse to work on anything that doesn't really correlate with those principles and those values. Very good. Very good. I like that. I like that. See, um, I try to step away sometimes to look at things that are going on around me or right now africa you see all those things you talked about are very true but sometimes i look at them and say are we as africans actually doing all we can to make things work for us okay and I would, I, I would say, no, we're not. No. Okay. See, yes, we're colonized, and some of the remnants of colonialism is still there in the continent. But then I look. My 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 father was a histor history teacher, and from a, from young age, I've been very immersed with history. And I look at every country that was colonized. In fact, there are very few countries in the world that haven't been colonized at one time or the other. And when the colonial power leave, there are always remnants of the colonization. Okay. Yeah. Now, it depends, what I've seen is that it depends on how well the locals use those systems to energize their communities. Or if they would rather use the system to continue the domination of their own people. Okay, and I, I say, we have really done that. We, we have imbibed the domination using the, the colonial system. You know, anyway, let's, let's leave that. <laughs> but but my, point is that, my, <laughs> my, my, my point is that we can do better. Yeah, we, sure. as Africans, can do a lot better. Yeah. You know, yeah. Of course, so, yeah, yeah. it's a two-way street. It's not only foreign investors that need to do better by us on the continent, but it's yeah. also us. We also need to step up. Yeah, um, that's it. In in, uh, in different ways, and definitely agree with you that there's yeah. uh, room for improvement on both ends. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, I mean, hey, you just uh, returned for from uh, Switzerland. Well, yeah, in Tanzania right now. And uh, I also assume that you travel to various countries, other Eastern African countries, and then South Africa as your domain. So uh, as you travel, um, I will assume that you have seen opportunities in every country you have been. In fact, uh, I talked to uh, the trade... Ooh, I can't remember his, his title in, in Uganda. And he, he tells me about some very good uh, opportunities in, in Uganda. So I assume there are so many other opportunities around the, the region. So I, I, I want you to tell us some of those opportunities uh, that have been, that, that have the most potential impact, you know, that we need to unlock? Yeah, definitely. That's a great question. Um, there are so many opportunities, to be, to be honest. I mean, we're looking at economies that are not developed, right? 
Uh, so the so the opportunities are just vast from you know infrastructure obviously, which is a uh, which is unfortunately underdeveloped in a lot of the uh, East African uh, markets, uh, be it transport, uh, uh, road infrastructure, railway, energy infrastructure. Uh, so I think infrastructure is a huge opportunity uh, because I think we. Uh, need infrastructure in order to really develop and to industrialize, right? The world is, uh, the yeah. rest of the world, let's say the developed world are talking about the fifth industrial re revolution, whilst uh, African countries have hardly even scratched the surface of, of the fourth industrial re yeah. revolution. So I think when we talk of opportunities, um, on that note, I, I tend to be a little bit frustrated uh, because um, there is this massive wave of, you know, fifth industrial revolution, you know, also ki kind of coming into Africa. And, you know, we're looking at all these um, uh, advanced technology uh, investments, AI and all this. And there's a massive focus on that even for the continent. And I think that this is... Um, uh this is this is not really where we are <laughs> um, i'm on your side on that okay continue yeah, um you know when we're looking at kind of uh, a lot of uh, more private capital that's coming into the market they're wanting these tech you know like replicas of silicon valley type investments in africa and you know uh clean tech and clean energy and you know and all this stuff um and you know don't get me wrong there there is massive advancements in technology particularly when you look in nigeria in south africa in egypt and in kenya uh, ironically enough this is like the access right on yeah on on, on the African continent, but what about the rest? You know, there is still opportunity in just investing in food businesses, food processing, you know, without elements of tech and clean <laughs> and clean energy, you know, or, you know, just construction companies, you know, uh, you know, just kind of the, so what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that a lot of the time, the, the, the the narrative in terms of investments and investment opportunities even is being set outside of Africa and it's coming into Africa, but it's not really in line with the realities on the ground. Wow. Wow. So, hey, yeah. I, w I wasn't expecting that. Yeah. I, but I think, but I, you are correct. Yeah, I think I think uh, if we're really just to be uh, um, honest with what with uh, with where we are in Africa, we're not there. We're not in the we're not there to the level that we would like that some people would like us to be. I, I would I would like to say right. Wow. So, so I think that there's still room for just the traditional inv investments in construction businesses in in food processing businesses, uh, uh, water sanitation solutions, you know. Uh, m m mundane to the West, very mundane things. Very mundane. Uh, I, that are not there in Africa. And if we focus on them, let's say for the next 10 years will be more able to join the fifth industrial revolution. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I could not say this even more. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really important. I think that, I think that where, you know, even in terms of the, um, massive drive when it comes to energy security to look at renewable energy that's number one energy number yes. one yes energy for sure but there's a massive push on terms of renewable energies when we have when we have so much oil in the continent 
And if we focus on using what we have, we yeah. have the technologies are very mature and it will be a lot easier to implement with less exper experimentation. Yeah. Rather, what I've talked to a lot of young people and everybody is saying renewable, renewable, renewable. See, I I I to to talk to one of my 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 few my last few guests, I asked him what countries in the developed world has actually implemented any of these to a sustainable level. Just name one. He couldn't. Yet, that is what we are pushing in our continent. That will not allow us to catch up. Yeah. We will now become the, the, the experimental table for what has not worked in more developed places. Yep, and and I think that um, yeah, there there is there is a lot of uh, this copy paste, right? Um, and I think that that th this comes about with a with a maybe a different um, discussion that needs to be had. Yeah, which is this uh, thinking. A lot of African countries, right? We see, um, you know, all the African leaders went to this U.S. Africa Business Summit last year. You know, there's the um, Great Great Britain, Africa, all these like Western countries. Africa summits where they kind of bring all these leaders and um, African leaders are essentially looking for private capital to unlock private capital that can come and invest into their in, into into their respective countries and that's and that's great but the problem that I'm seeing is that increasingly the ones with the private capital come with a lot of conditionalities that are not in line with the needs of Africa or the realities of Africa. Hmm. So right now there is a, a a lot of private capital that is focused for renewable energy, clean energy, you know, technology, uh, and 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 all that. But what about the rest? So maybe it's time for um, African countries to maybe focus more on the South-South cooperation. I think for the for a very long time, people were laughing at this. You know, some people say like, what does another poor country, what can another poor country do for me? You know, so we need to go back to the US, to France, to all these countries because they're rich and they have money and, you know, you can deal with them. But but are they really cognizant or are they really um, aware of the realities? You know, I think other Southern countries, like if you look at India, if you definitely look at China, I would, although China is definitely not poor, by the way, but <laughs> not, not anymore, <laughs> not, not anymore for sure. But, you know, and neither is India, at least when you compare to to. To, uh, uh, most of Af Africa, yes. Most of Africa, yes. But but you know, but just the southern south to south corporations. I think that the private capital that comes from the from from these countries, first of all, has less conditionalities. There's none of this kind of moral high ground of how you know you need to look into human rights and you need to. Not that I'm saying that human rights is. I not I, I get you. Don't worry. Don't, don't, you don't need to explain those things to me. I I yes. get you. It's a problem when when private capital that is that is needed to develop schools, to develop, you know, infrastructure, you know, energy and all these healthcare, et cetera, is kind of you dangled. And, you know, it's like you have to kind of jump through hoops. Um, 
in order to actually get you know to actually get that and uh and a lot of it is you know it's very subjective as well um so so yeah um we kind of went went a little bit or no, i went a see, little I, bit I, I, I love i love it see i love this see uh that's why i i don't like to uh ask very specific questions okay see i i like to just put something on the table and just let the knife cut the the carve the meat <laughs> any way you want to you know see yeah. see what you just you just talked about is very important uh now i will say this we as africans can learn from every area every, every part of the continent but we need to be cognizant of the the level of evolution of every 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 region we are trying to learn from yeah okay so to me china india in particular to me india is i mean india is still very poor okay i think i think the whole the whole sub region is still very very poor okay but but they are closest to africa okay in the way the the everyday indian ed, ed, everyday indian life is very close to africa okay and the the technologies we think we want to get from the west india has a lot of it in fact uh they are a yeah. big partner in that drive for the whole world okay so we can learn a, a lot of things from india we can learn a lot of things from china now for me for me i'm i'm all about education see the drive for development is hinged on education and that's that's the area i'm most interested in because we as a continent our governments have not focused on it see if we actually want to develop africa our governments need to focus more in primary secondary school education Absolutely. more than anything else because yeah. if you want a massive army of young people to actually do the work of educating uh, of developing africa they need to be skilled see so if you if you if you open our borders and invite experts to come and help us those experts need to work with locals and if the locals are not they don't have the adequate knowledge for them to tap into what the experts are saying we can't get anything from it yeah okay so see just but what I, what i've seen is that somehow we are jumping one two levels everywhere going to the highest level going for ai tech tech is good okay but tech like you said tech is not going to feed a massive population tech is not because i don't i don't want to i mean the ukraine russia war has exposed our inability to feed ourselves yeah 
So this this kind of thing is to prick the mind of our leaders that oh oh maybe we should invest more in agriculture. Yeah. Hey, uh, see, I know, I know there are so many opportunities now in Africa, but we need to be very strategic to make sure we we focus on the the ones that are most important. Yes, for sure, no. for sure. Yeah, yeah. and agriculture wow. is definitely uh, the biggest opportunity on the continent, not only to feed the continent, but to feed the world. Exactly. Because of the land that we have, et cetera. But, you know, I think that there's a lot of also complexities about this because when you're talking about trade and investment for Africa, you cannot... Um, you cannot leave the multilateral systems that are created, for example, the World Trade Organization, um, that kind of unfortunately um, put African African countries in um, in a condition that is that is not really uh, ripe for for uh, self sufficiency. Mm. Um, but you know i think i'm seeing a lot of leaders challenging that challenging these multilateral uh systems whether it comes whether uh it has to do with financing uh or or trade and investment um and i think it's because it's just not no longer working mm. and when you're looking at the african uh, continent uh we have the youngest population in the world i think the statistics are really um uh mind-boggling because at the same time you're like wow such an opportunity 75 percent of the continent are below 30 i think yeah. this is the yeah these are the statistics but at the same time it's extremely worrying exactly because what are you <laughs> going to do with all these young people if there are no jobs and if there are no opportunities uh and and you and like you say education is um is that because of that statistic education yeah. should be the number one yeah. that lead, leaders are investing in but unfortunately we're not seeing in, enough investment going into that i i i think that we need to stop investing in things and start investing in people in people yeah 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 wow see i i would tell you i didn't expect a discussion to go to, to go this route at all <laughs> Yeah. So uh, <laughs> now we just mentioned that uh, uh, that some of our leaders are now challenging how the glo global system is working. But I want us to take it back home first. Now we you want we want investors, but something we need to have to enable us to attract the kind of investors we want and keep them in the on the continent i think it's about the way our own legacy systems work so as a lawyer does the legacy systems of the countries you have been working with are they adequate to resolve disputes? I mean, if I want investors, I'm not, I, I, at least I need to be. I need to assure them that their investment is secure. Yes. Legally. So, yes. Uh, uh, how 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 are we doing in that area? Well, listen. I mean, I think that. Um... Every country is different when it comes to legal systems yeah. and uh, how developed they are. Uh, so, for example, if you look at the Kenyan uh, legal system, especially with the strides uh, that they've had because of their constitution, um, you would say that the justice system is more uh, free and impartial uh, then uh, let's say a country in Tanzania where you have the executive, the president is the one that appoints all the judges. Wow. Uh, 
um, you know, can we really say that where there is a dispute, uh, where the government is a party, uh, and it's a you know a dispute that where whereby the stakes are very high, uh, that that investors yeah. can really trust that the justice system is going to be impartial uh, and and fair in uh, in rendering um, in rendering justice. Um, Mm. <laughs> I'll let you, you want to answer that, but um, but I think that um, from what I have seen, you know, it's 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 not only about the justice system in Africa. Okay, it's also about us as individuals. How committed are we to the rule of law? Ooh. That's how a, that's a big question. Yeah, how committed are we to the rule of law? How committed are we to agreements and contracts? And you still find that, forget about the justice system, but just in terms of the rapport that private parties are having. Yeah. I think that there needs to be more that can be done in terms of really respecting contracts, you know, respecting the word, you know, the commitment that you take. And, you know, I think that there's a lot that, that needs to be, that needs to be done there. But also then when you look at um, the, our leaders, how committed are they to uphold the, the rule of law? And we see that sometimes it's a little bit challenging um, to really, to, to really just respect the law, even if it's not really something. In your favor. And if you don't like it, then follow the process to amend it, to change it, as opposed to getting very comfortable using executive orders for everything. And by the way, you know, we we see this in the U.S. Uh, as well, right? Uh, it's not only an African issue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, um, so there, there are those layers, I think, also that need to be, um, that need to be dealt with, yeah. but then also definitely when you're talking about investment uh right now for example in tanzania uh the largest investment that that we're looking at is the lng project okay uh, right and this is a multi-billion not even million billion uh dollar project and um we've seen laws change to essentially accommodate international arbitration okay for these types of investments uh meaning that in the event of a dispute this dispute resolution mechanisms are not going to be in tanzania but are most likely going to be in london or yeah. new york mm. or you know essentially outside of the continent and i think that um Maybe we're not really um, understanding what that really means. Um, because the it's it's of course, it's about the impartiality of the justice system and the for the justice system to deliver justice, right? Yeah. And how likely are they going to be able to? But also countries like the u k, are favored nations for 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 dispute resolution because of years and centuries of decision making that yeah. they have so an abundance of 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 decisions yeah. right of precedents that exist so that in the most unlikely event of some matter you're going to find a precedent in the UK yeah right why? Because you have so many cases over the years. This is a preferred place for, for dealing with disputes, right? Yeah. So if we're not committed to improving our justice system so that parties can choose it with confidence, yeah. that the justice system develops precedents so that the market becomes mature enough to accommodate investments that are strategic. So it's not only that lens that we sometimes like to look at, it's much broader than that. Yeah. 
if we keep being comfortable, if if our leaders uh, keep um, uh, giving away, making concessions, saying, okay, you know what, for your disputes, we can we accept international arbitration. When is your local justice system going to be developed? Good. That's a good that, that's a good question. Yeah. Okay. See, like you said, even disputes with two local parties, right? We are not sure that the judge, that the system will work without partiality. I mean, see, we we need we need we most of us don't don't really understand what rule of law means many of us think it's just a, a catchphrase yeah. of the west w one thing is this uh that uh, i have found and it worries me about uh, young Africans because I tell them one thing, read. I beg them, please read. And uh, very few of us want to read. You see, again, I, I say this, it seems I'm, I'm banging on, on these things all the time. But it, I bang on because it's important. You see, if if we want to develop, we need to look at the the, the countries that are ahead of us and ask ourselves, why? How did they do it? Yeah. You see, there, there is no country who have developed that didn't first had a large population of their country read. See, the rule of law was very, very consequential for the, the Britain becoming the first industrialized nation in the world. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. It's uh, definitely um, it's a great point. Um, but you know the experience that I have, especially when I'm working with, let's say, local um, investors or business people, uh, is that a lot of the time they don't even um, sometimes some of them don't even care about like about contracts. So for example, you give them a contract and they'll just sign and- Yeah, without reading it. And they're like, no, oh, it's okay. Because they <laughs> they feel that, you know, if it goes to the justice system, I can always find a way. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there, there needs to be a lot, a lot of work needs to be done on that to change the mindset yeah. um, and to get, um, to get people to just, you know, realize that rule of law is not just some Western concept and that, you know, in Africa, we can like just do about it. Rule of law exists even, the rule of law exists even in, in the, because religion is a huge thing in Africa and all the scriptures. Yeah. It's the rule of law. Yeah. So it's a Western concept. It's just needed for a society to work. Yeah. And when you're looking at investments, um, you know, if you can't guarantee to investors that if you come and invest, you know, your money here, that it's if safe. ever anything goes wrong, you know, there is a justice system that at least, you, you know, get something yeah. back. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If if we can't do that, then uh, nobody I'm, invest. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Or we'll always have, um, you know, lower quality types of investment that, um you know, because you, no one is really willing to take that risk. Yeah, yeah. Now, Africa 
see one of the the things uh, that we haven't done well, okay, uh, and it shows from our discussion. You see, Africa is a big place, big place, uh, and we have a uh, one point three four billion people. Majority of them very young people. So, we as a continent are a market itself. Yes. But we haven't taken advantage of our market. Okay. So, that is what the African uh, continental free trade uh, area is supposed to help us with. So what, what do you see on the horizon and what are the major challenges uh, to the success of the African wild, wide venture of the free, free area? I think it's a massive, massive opportunity. And I think it's, um, if done right, it can change the trajectory of Africa. Um, you see, if we have the Africa, uh, an Africa continental free trade area, which we already have, but that is fully operational. I think right now there's um, around maybe close to 40 countries that have actually ratified. Uh, but, you know, there's like 50, it's 50 four countries. 40, I think close to 40. Last time I checked, which was like last uh, or beginning of this year or last year, I think it was like around 35 or 36 okay. countries. But if every African nation actually went on board with this, I don't think we need to trade with anybody else. <laughs> yeah. No, but the problem is, is that um, I think that uh, Africans still don't believe that we can do business with each other and we don't need, our goals are still to do business with the United States of America and to do business with China, to do business with Europe, but our goals is not to do business with our neighbors. You know, like we still, we can't think in Tanzania, I can't think of, oh, I, Gabon, for example, mm. you know, forget about Gabon. We even have, or before the, the Africa free trade area that exists, there's uh, regional blocks that have been existing before that. How well are those functioning? Mm. You yeah. know. How, how well is ECOWAS? What, what, yes, what, how what, well what, is West Africa? ECOWAS or how well is the East African community functioning? Uh, you know, there's been, I think, uh, the, the for East, the East African community, there's the the protocol for free movement of yeah. of uh, services, people, uh, you know, goods, uh, fi capital, and I think that we're supposed to fully uh, integrate in 2012. There was a grace period given until 2015, but you look now, it's 2023, and apart from the customs unions, which is the first phase yeah. of integration, when we move into the free movement of people, not enough has been done. We're seeing now, you know, Kenya has, and uh, there are countries that are playing their part, like Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, but there are other countries, unfortunately, that are a lot slower um, on, on kind of implementing. And that's what I'm worried about for the Africa free trade area is that, we have regional blocks already that exist. And unfortunately, are they really fully functional? No. Are they even 50% functional? No. Um, they're below 50%. 50 so now we're moving into this massive free trade area, which is a huge opportunity. But I'm just a little bit skeptical in terms of like, will every nation african nation really play their part or are we going to see the same usual sus suspects you know that are championing this but others are kind of still going to be on the wall on the fence not really fully committing not really you know 
not not really um implementing what needs to be implemented that's that's something that that the first thing that i that i'm kind of a little bit uh, skeptical about the second thing i think is that um in terms of the actual implementation uh so as a lawyer uh you know you can have law but it's dead law if it can't be operational and how is it okay. operational it's operational when you actually create rules and regulations so very specific rules and regulations that are actually going to be implementing the mother law so now we're at the implementation stage and i think that what i'm going to say maybe is a little bit unpopular but i think it needs to be said is that we're involving development partners to do the implementation of our own rules and those development partners come from germany and you know from from other countries and i'm a little bit skeptical about that because i don't think that there is when the european union were coming about up with their um rules for you know integrating their their area i don't think you had any african experts writing the rules there or even being consulted yeah so uh, i'm just a little bit skeptical about um about that about about you know i i think that in africa of course we are used to this development partners they're helping us develop they've been helping us develop they're going to help us develop for for, for the last 40 years and yet yes. we're still they're, they're need, us needing develop. them today <laughs> yes they're helping us develop and <laughs> we're still not developing and they're helping us to develop i'm going <laughs> to but um but i'm just a little bit um a bit a little bit skeptical about something like this that i think has to be fully owned by by africa um and 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 it's a bit little bit difficult for me to believe that there are no african experts whether on the continent but also the diaspora i think exactly or as massive that we can't use uh those resources and that it has to be um see people, i you know, i i, I would say well, I'll, let me talk about the lagos uh country uh if you go to london here or go to new york the financial capitals of the world all right i'm sure if you go to any of the big financial institutions and you go to their legal departments or you go to big law firms in these places i'm sure you won't uh, pass two three of those firms before you find a very senior lawyer who is african i'm sure about that why am I sure? Because I know some of them. Okay? Some of them are friends. So, see, if we really want to do these things, uh, our continent must be ready to bring back some of our people from wherever they are. Yeah. We need to entice them to come home yeah. to do the work we need them to do. Because they are doing this kind of work for this, their firms. Yeah. Okay. So if we think this pro program is very, very important for the continent, we must be willing to drag them back Okay, of course, drag them back with uh, incentives. Yeah. Rather than, like you mentioned, uh, Europe, uh, European Union didn't uh, invite uh, 
Africa to help them, or maybe the, I don't know. I don't. I don't believe they invited the U.S. to help them. Okay. Absolutely, and I think that 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 goes back to we need to trust each other. We need to trust each other. We need to trust each other as Africans to trade with one another, to do business with one another, but also to uh, use and share our knowledge and exchange our knowledge uh, with one another. And uh, unfortunately, I think that um, one of the uh, remnants of uh, colonialism is that, is the profound mistrust that we have for one another. I, I have a different view of, of that. Uh, I don't think that mistrust uh, comes from colonialism. It comes from our diversity and the way we have been with one another even before colonialism. See, see if you... Oh, man. If you read... Uh, more Kadima. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what that's what is called by uh Ibrahim Kadun, a for a, a, a 14th century scholar, a Tunisian scholar. He talks about uh uh Asabiya. You see, check, check it out later. See, he, 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 the thing is that tribes have that tendency to not trust the next tribe okay it has it has always been there so for for me if we want to start trusting each other in the modern modern world now well the legal system will help us if we build a legal system that is impartial okay now it, it will take time okay for it to work but if we build the system and start working one year two years three years four years ten years now when you and i do business together and the system works in a very impartial way and it does what it's supposed to do when we have these skills. After a while, we start trusting each other. Even yeah. in Europe, okay, the Germans and the English, the English and the French didn't trust each other. Mm -hmm. They fought a lot, a lot of wars. But today, they trust each other better than they used to because of the system they, they, they have built together. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So I think uh, we need to we need to build those systems that will eventually help us integrate better. You know. Yeah. 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 Good points. Wow. Uh, this. Uh, see, I I really I really want us to do our best to make this this uh, agreement work. See, yeah. like you said. Where we, the the market, if it works correctly, uh, it will develop Africa to such a level that uh, we, when we go out there, the our, our other pa external partners will be more willing to invest in the continent and work with us as equals. Absolutely, and I think that. Um... Together, uh, the African markets are a lot more um, have a have a more uh, a, a bigger value proposition yeah. for investors as well. If they know that they can come and invest in, you know, fifty three forty markets, um, you know, easily, and that there are no barriers. I mean, that's a total, uh, you know, game changer as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's that's good. See, uh, as I talk to you, uh, I get excited, and uh, at the same time, I get worried because I see the 
enormity of the of of the work we need to do yeah you see uh but hey overall i'm excited see africa is the place to be i'm telling you I've, and i've been preaching it uh before my injury because uh, i i was preaching it to my friends that hey we need to go back we need to go back unfortunately many of them I've, i've gone back i'm here <laughs> soon you soon yeah, oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah oh yeah let's take it in in in, in a different way see like i said i i love to t- i love to to read and i want uh young africans to read because uh so many things are going on in the world so many things have gone on the, in the world before we came here and the only way we can know about those things uh is to pick up a book and read yeah. you know so i'm a big advocate of reading so i want my audience to have the habit of reading and uh, so i right. i i always always ask my guest to recommend five books So please recommend five books to my audience. Okay, um let's see five books. Mm. So uh okay, you know, I think maybe it's important to say that uh for me I love reading. I've always yeah. been reading, but very it's good. Like, um what you'll find in my library is very seasonal. Mm. I mean, that it's not always the same so the la- the um, i think this year and last year uh i've been very much obsessed with mindset okay and, um and um and just uh unlocking the mind uh seeking more possibilities um so i've been reading a lot of uh books around that so i okay. think that very good one book that i can uh recommend um is um uh emancipation from uh, mental slavery by marcus okay. yeah um i really like uh, reading that uh, book because it talks about um just you know mental slavery yeah. what that means and how you can really like uh, un- uh you know unlock that and the second book is uh think and grow rich yeah Napoleon Hill up there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh that I think I would definitely uh recommend uh Very good one. Read. Both of them good ones. Yeah. Yeah, another one is uh The Power of Now by okay. Eka Tolle is up there. Yeah. Yep. Mhm. Yeah, um I think a lot of us especially in this world where you know it's very materialistic and uh social media and all this we don't really take the moment to the time to be very present and to just be very grateful for where we are now uh as opposed to always chasing uh, more the next one. yes uh so that's a book that I definitely recommend very good. Uh another one is uh, breaking the habit of being yourself. Ah. Yeah. Can <laughs> come to that. Joe Joe D- Dispensa. Mm-hmm. I, I have a have a three up four is books. Yeah. 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 So I'm a fan of Joe Dispensa and yep. his work. I'm a big fan uh, myself. Yeah. Uh so I would definitely recommend to read I that. I learned I learned to meditate with him. Yeah me too. Okay, very good. So me too. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. And I think he's really uh uh changed a lot in me, you know, the person that I am now is not necessarily the person I was 3 years ago. Yeah. Yeah, uh, that's good. It has a lot to do with his uh teachings. Um another book that I'm uh would recommend that I'm reading now is also called The Psychology of Money. Oh, uh somebody recommended that maybe two sessions ago very good oh yes. yeah morgan housel okay yeah uh yeah so like i said uh for me right now it's all about uh my mind uh strengthening my mind uh mental gymnastics 
uh, but also just um, financial freedom. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think we're taught in school that uh, we need to work hard and then uh, <laughs> do all these uh, irrelevant subjects that, you know, we find later on. It's like, why did I study all those things? <laughs> now? Uh, study all those things and then go out there and then you'll make money. And then most people are like, but how come I'm not making money? But, you yeah. know. Guess what? A lot of the things that we're taught in school have nothing to do stops with you. how to it, make money. It actually money. stops you from making money. <laughs> yeah. 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 And so being a businessman and an entrepreneur, um, I've kind of become a lot more um aware of the power of my mind. Yeah. Uh, so I try to nurture my mind, exercise my mind. Um okay. and I recommend that for others as well. Very good. One more, one more, one more. I think I was on my fifth. No, that's that's a fourth. Come on, one more. I'm sure. I'm sure you can do that. Um, which one is another one that I'm uh, currently reading? The art of not. Giving... Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, giving a fuck. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah, I ha I haven't read it, but I've watched the limited series on on oh. Netflix. Oh, yeah. I didn't. Know that they were, oh, it, was... it just came, it just came out some few few months ago. I've read. I've watched two episodes. Yeah, yeah but yeah. yeah, yeah. So, uh, also, uh, I think uh, again, you know, uh, when you reach your forties, uh, I think you kind of um, <laughs> just want to live your life and stop caring <laughs> about what everybody thinks thinks and, about you yeah yes. yeah um exactly and i think that when you have been conditioned to uh, seek the va constant validation uh of uh, of everybody else sometimes you need a bit of a self help book that yeah. can uh, assist you in terms of how to really uh, <laughs> uh, break the break the chains of uh, of uh, of validation, seeking yeah. third party validation, constant validation. Yeah. So thank you very much for that uh, series of recommendations. Now, the last thing I, I usually ask, uh, I want to combine the last two questions one is about helping young africans to do something in their community add value to the community and the second one what is your vision for africa in the next 30 years so what do you see okay what do you want to see in the future about africa Okay, those are great questions. Uh, I think in terms of the, my advice for young people. Um, I think the number one advice that I would give is to stop waiting for government to do things for you. Ooh. Very good one. Yeah, I think that um, go after your dreams. Um do things we can do a lot of things without government and i think that what i've seen is that government will shift or will will become of help when you're helping yourself thank you yeah so I think that a lot of the time uh, when I speak to youth, there's this kind of uh, disappointment, you know, our leaders are not doing this, our leaders are not doing that. And I'm not saying that this are, these are not valid uh, considerations, uh, but I think that if you're an active person in society and a valued member of society, um and you create change within your capacity eventually that catches up yeah so um, so i think that's uh that's uh that's one number two 
in terms of the vision that um that I see for Africa in 30 years time is I think I see a continent that is a lot more sure of their place in the global world and what they bring to the table uh what they bring to the table and what they bring to the world and what they have to offer i definitely see that and especially if the africa continental free trade uh, area is done properly uh but also if our youth uh are engaged and you know remain to be dynamic and uh, change makers within their society i definitely see that even in the leadership it it will be younger as well and so it it then becomes a lot more hopeful and and promising uh th this is what i would like this is what i would like to believe good wow i mean i'll tell you this uh, conversation has gone a lot better than I thought it would be. <laughs> That's I'm, great. I, I'm telling you, I I see, I love your, the way you think. I truly appreciate it. And I'm sure your, your clients, the people you are helping, uh, appreciate it. Uh, and I, I, I really hope uh, I will travel to Tanzania and I'll meet you in person uh, when I start going around Africa. Thank you very much for being a great guest of Think Big, the Think Big for Africa podcast. Thank you so much, Akene, for having me. And thank you so much for the great work that you're doing uh, when it comes to Africa. I think that you know, uh, changing uh, the perception of Africa is done through various fronts. Of course, there's yeah. the work I'm doing, but also the work that you're doing, which is provoking all these conversations. I think that it's extremely important. And I think it's important that um, there's been a big, uh, you know, the buzzwords of Africa rising the last few years. And, you know, people are just using these buzzwords uh but you know they need to move beyond the buzzwords yeah. you know and i do believe that africa is rising um but it needs the right people the right mindset to really then move from just you know this theoretical thing to actually like you know more more concrete so yeah. that's the great work that you're doing and i can't wait to keep following you and hearing what your other guests will have to say as well all right. Same here. Too. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you All so right. much. Take yeah. care. Have a great okay. day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.